This week on CrossFeed. Returning to church again for the first time. Romney's faith. Run silent, run deep. Catholic colleges. Obamacare means no care. The voice. The translation, not the talent show. And as Shorter says, don't drink any alcohol or leave. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. No, we did not pod fade. We are back. And um, I am Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. It's good to be back for this one week. Uh, uh, then we're going to be off next week because Dale's got a lot going on. We would have been here last week. We had every intention uh, but Time Warner decided to play games over in Ohio, and so Dale, the Dale's thing died, and that was all there was to it. Yeah. At first they tried to blame me. I called, and they said, there's no outages in your area, and just reset your <coughs> modem. And So I reset my modem, and it didn't work, so I called them back and said, oh, there's an outage in your area. <laughs> so. Great. So, but we're on tonight. I'm so excited. We're it's on, been so long. On a holiday weekend, even. Yeah, boy, we work hard, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we do. So, yeah, what can we say? So, you know, we're not. We're not. I, we're not even going to pay time and a half for this. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> oh, you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see. Time and a half on nothing. <laughs> That's right. All right, but. So it's been what over? A, it's been like what since Easter, something like that. It's just been very busy. Uh, you know, we were going to a couple times. We were going to, and uh, I wasn't feeling well. And one night, I was just just so much been going on. I was just exhausted. Um, and then I had to go away to my brother's wedding. And then we had Mother's Day, and Dale, something else came up. So it's just been extremely busy. Yeah, actually, since uh, I. We did this last, actually, we actually got two of our bathrooms completely redone. Went all the way down to studs and completely redone. Well, and while we were gone, uh, our Shepherd of the Ridge added a second service. Uh, before, we just had a traditional service, and now we added a uh, what we're calling Horizon, a modern Lutheran service. Um, it's uh, anybody that's familiar with liturgical worship, uh, it has... Uh, liturgical elements, and um, and it, it sort of follows. You, you'd find the outline of it familiar, um, but it uses uh, modern music, uh, a lot of stuff by Casting Crowns and um, some Chris Tomlin and, and and stuff like that, and um, and then uh, the it, it's it's just a lot more conversational and and less formal. And yeah. Dale's idea of an invocation now is, hey, y'all, how you doing? <laughs> well, no, you know, th that's one of the things that I really like about it is that um, it, it gives me an opportunity to sort of explain things. Um, and so the invocation is actually a lot longer because I introduce it by s talking about God's presence with us and um, and things like that. And I tie it in with the theme for the day. And, um, and so it's, it's, I take each of the elements and, and explain them. Um, you know, we've got a, a section instead of calling it the Sanctus and the proper preface and all that, it's just called worshiping with saints and angels. And, and so I, I talk about how, uh, our worship, um, you know, we join our voices with those in heaven and, and things like that. And, and so I, you know, I've, I've really been enjoying it. It's been well received, um, on a side benefit, really, uh, attendance for this time of year is up. Um, you know, it's down overall, but it's May and it always goes down in May, but, um, but is there more money? That's the important <laughs> that I really haven't looked at. <laughs> oh, see now see, that's how you know if it's really worth doing. Is there more money <laughs> anyway? Uh, but, uh, well, I'm glad to hear and stuff. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, where should we begin tonight? Uh, well, since you're doing this, this modern service, maybe you need a new modern translation. There you go. Yeah, we're actually uh, using uh, the new literal translation, or new, new living, 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 new living tra yeah. translation. Which was a, um, well, everybody remembers the Living Bible, which mm -hmm. was a paraphrase. Well, this is actually a translation, but it was... Mm -hmm. 
done similar to the Living Bible. And it's not too bad of a translation. No, no. Something. Every once in a while, I kind of have to go. Oh well, we're going to have to use something else, or you know, or something like that. But overall, it's pretty good. Or you can make corrections in it. Yeah, yeah. And you, know, you, 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 you know, do your own edits. But uh, I don't think I'm going to be using this translation. Yeah. Um. So it's called the Voice. It's published by um, Thomas Nelson, um, and you know, once again, they're trying to, you know, come up with an accurate translation for American readers. That's what they you know, say they're doing. So um, instead of Jesus Christ, it's now Jesus the Anointed One, or Jesus the Liberating King. Instead of angel, it's messenger. And instead of apostle, it's emissary. Now, I can't understand why the idea of emissary is... More understandable. More understandable than the word apostle. I just, you know, I'm sorry. I think Ben Sisko, you know. I just, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you know, why not use a term like ambassador or something like that? Um, but I suppose that has a lot of connotations to it. I don't know. Translation is a hard thing. And, and so even though, yeah, I don't think I'll be using this one either. Um, my hat's off to him for their attempt. Uh, I actually, I'm, I'm annoyed. I got an email from, I don't know, it was like you version or something like that saying, well, because you're using another Thomas Nelson, um, translation for your studies, we're going to give you a free download of the, it was like a PDF of the voice. And then like I clicked on it to, I, I right clicked it to download it. And uh, apparently I wasn't supposed to right-click it. I was supposed to just click on it, left-click it, and um, and then it ended up... I, I got this kind of weird file, and then I wasn't able to download it and say, well, you already downloaded it. And I was really annoyed because, you know, I was curious about it. I wanted to take a good look at it, and um, and then I couldn't get it. So, so it was interesting that you uh, chose this story. That so... One of the things I found I did kind of find interesting is they're focusing on dialogue. They're trying to cut out the he said and she said and they said and just focus on the dialogue. So Jesus walking in the waters, it's it's disciple, it's a ghost. Another disciple, a ghost? What will we do? Jesus said, be still, it is I. You have nothing to fear. And, I, and that is a little bit more dram- dynamic, I think. You know, yeah, it's, it's, so it's written like a play. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, you know, and you think about it, um, I, I see this, this sort of writing, uh, more and more. You think about like Facebook posts and things like that. People use that, um, style a lot. So it's a familiar style of writing. I'm, I'm curious what it does with, uh, places like Jeremiah. There's that, um, the passage where it's like every other, like every sentence ends in, um, says the Lord, says the Lord, says the Lord. Right. And, um, you know, so with, with some of those places where it, it, it really is emphasizing that God is saying this, this is the word of God. And, and, and it's specifically written that way to emphasize this isn't from me. This isn't anything else. This is the word of God. So, but, you know, I mean, it's one of those things that no matter how you translate, you'll lose something. You can translate it one way and you lose one thing. And if you translate it another way, you lose it another way. You know, um, I suppose that's probably one of the reasons why, uh, for Muslims, the Quran is only inspired. It's only actually the Quran if it's in Arabic that you're not supposed to translate it. Well, even we would argue that to a certain extent because we were talking about the fact that you did, you know, no, you know, what do they used to tell us in seminary? Um, the best translation. Is at best a commentary, you yeah, know, well, because you know, there's a certain amount of interpretation. I, I remember I had uh, uh, Doctor Veltz for um, for hermeneutics, and uh, and he had just finished uh, his book, and, and in fact, we got copies of it before it was available. Um, we had like photocopies of the first few chapters so that we could. Uh, start using it until the book was available. So we got it hot off the pref- presses. And, um, and you know, when we talked about uh, scriptural uh, inspiration, um, he, he said the conceptual signifieds 
are the um, the part that's inspired. And, and in other words, it, it's not because you know you get into these issues of of differences in um, in uh, manuscripts and you know what is and what isn't and all that kind of stuff. And he said, what it comes down to is what the authors meant. That's the important part. And, um, you know, and so that's why translation is important to figure out what exactly did the authors mean by that. And, um, and so well, we, we've always said that's not a, it's not, it's inspires, not a dictation. Right. Right. So, uh, of course I think I go back to our article here. Um, uh, 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 you know, I, I wish they had gotten hold of, you know, uh, one of the editors from the New International Version, or maybe one of the editors of the English Standard Version, or somebody with some honest <laughs> critique, um, <laughs> critique of critical thinking. <laughs> yes. No. Instead, for their respondent, they get somebody from Franklin Road Baptist Church of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. <laughs> I just, I just said, I mean, what's it? I just King James you, you know? only. <laughs> yeah, King James only. You know, it's the most accurate translation. Other translations don't stick to a word for word translation. Uh, they say other translations are easier to read, more accurate. We disagree. Uh, yeah. Look, the, you know, the King James is not a word for word translation. There is no such thing as a word for word translation. You can't do that. No, you can't. I mean, you know, even the King James Version, Mike Norris, the Franklin Road Baptist Church of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. God, that didn't sound like a a hick. Anyway, you know, uh, hey, the word Episcopal. You, you watch it. You you say that about him, and he will send his uncle dad after you. <laughs> no, he sent his coon dogs after me. Him, and Bubba. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, you, 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 you got to go down to southern southern Ohio, right across the line from well, from Kentucky, and then you go into Kentucky and meet the Bubba's, and then you'll understand. But anyway, um, you know, because they translate, for example, uh, Episcopoi is bishop. That right there is is a an interpretation of that word. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not necessarily. Uh, you know, and I don't know. So I, I just wished it that if they're going to come up with a somebody to critique it, they'd been somebody serious to critique. Yeah, really, it. was nobody else available? <laughs> <laughs> they, they could, I mean, you know, with, with you know, they, no, no seminary professor available. I mean, there's had to be somebody out there. You know, that, I mean, even from an evangelical, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, I don't. Well, granted, I wouldn't want them from Andover Newton, you know. <laughs> seminary where they go Bible what's a Bible but you know and something else might work well hey we're in Tennessee we might as well go right next door over to uh, Georgia mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> this kind of deals with kind of the same subject um, and this is an a interesting um uh, uh, um, there's a, there's a, I've never even heard of the school, Shorter University. No, neither. Um, uh, anyway, it's a Baptist school in Georgia. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Who would have believed that? <laughs> a Baptist school in Georgia? <laughs> Man. Anyway, um, so they, uh, have written a, um, and 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 shorter university they had a they were it's been a baptist school since its founding and in the 1950s they made an arrangement with the um georgia baptist convention part of the southern baptist convention to kind of take them over and it elects the um trustees well now um they have a, a pretty conservative board of regents and they said, what? Pretty conservative. Okay, they're fundies. Um, 
And they said, uh, um, uh, I, this guy named Dallas, who I think is the president of the, the university. Um, uh, yeah, Donald Dallas is the university president, said, you know, they, they, they were at a crossroads to, to either take steps to regain an authentic Christian identity and policy and practice or become a Christian university in name only. And so now they are requiring the faculty to sign a personal privilege that says that they will, um, that I reject as acceptable all such, I reject as, as acceptable all sexual activity not in agreement with the Bible, including but not limited to premarital sex, adultery, and homosexuality. I'm not sure what else there is. Um, I, I guess, yeah, porn, yeah. Which is a um, bigger problem than, <laughs> than any, any of these other ones? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it tends to go along with uh, uh, adultery and other things. Um, so, yeah, that, that stuff. And, oh, man, I can't believe this one. They will not engage in any illegal drug use or drink alcohol in restaurants, stadiums, or other public locations where they might be seen by other people or by students or... I looked up the I looked up their their uh, statement. They cannot consume alcohol in their homes six hours before a university event. Wow! So if there's if That's there's something intrusive. at six o'clock p.m., you better drink that beer at noon. And if there's something at um, three, make sure you get a drink that beer. Make sure you have that shot of whiskey at nine a.m. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, oh, no, that that true. part wasn't in the article. Um, yeah, I will not attend any university-sponsored event in which I have consumed alcohol within the last six hours. Neither will I promote or encourage the use of alcohol. I mean, it is. Hmm. Uh, well, I wouldn't make it. I mean, just looking at my Facebook page. <laughs> I like Mike's Hard Lemonade, so (laughs) it's one of my likes. I don't know about that. Sam Adams Cherry Wheat, but I'm (laughs) over here drinking, so, you know, we're doing this. You're out, too, now. I'm out, man. I'm out, um, you know. All right, on on a serious thing. I mean, I don't know where this school was going. Um, You know, the guy talks about a crossroads of an authentic Christian identity, in policy or practice, or a Christian university in name only. Um, I mean, I, I can't say, I don't know where this school was. I mean, they're, you know, it's hard, I think, for Christian universities to remain Christian universities. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, we there are all kinds of examples of what started out as Christian colleges and universities today not being anywhere near. A lot of them in your neck of the woods. Uh, yeah, a little place called Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Yeah, well, and now Georgetown. Yeah, Georgetown, which is, you know, kind of Catholic in name only. Um, well, given the, who their uh, commencement speaker is, did you hear about that? Oh, uh, uh, Sibelius. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know... Um, yeah, that's right. The writer of the the writer of the book, The Exorcist, said they were wrong. <laughs> but anyway, so there is that is a concern. I mean, you know, and I think that's a legitimate concern. I'm not so. I, 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 okay, but once you say that, so what's reasonable? I mean, right. and we got into this issue well within the LCMS because um, when you know we had the. Um, the split back in the 70s because one of the questions came in is well, what does it mean to be a seminary that teaches Lutheran theology you know how much a- academic freedom can you have how much you know narrowness can you have in, in what you allow but this goes beyond just a, a, a you know I mean I mean I mean, how do you draw those lines right. that's this question, that thing, this now some people aren't too happy about this. There's a website called Save Our Shorter, SOS, and which they're not happy. They're saying there's irreparable harm being damaged to the cause of Christ, and that they are destroying the reputation of their school. 
Well, you have to keep in mind that right, they have about 100 full-time faculty, and 36 have resigned and at least 25 cited disagreement with either the personal lifestyle statement or the faith statement. Right. I couldn't – I read through the faith statement too. I couldn't see as much wrong with it. I mean it was – other than, you know, probably they may be objecting to the fact that Scripture is called inerrant. Uh, but other than that, there's not much there that I couldn't see that was really outside of credo Christianity. Of course, being a Baptist school, they may object to having any type of statement of faith put over, over them. Well, you know, and that's an interesting bit, too. Is uh, That's something I thought of is that, okay, this is a Baptist school and, and they have a faith statement. Oh, hold on a minute here. You know, if if Baptists tend to reject human written faith statements. So, but at the same time, you know, that's it's sort of a... Um, it's sort of a paradox because you you could reject human faith statements, but then you go, well, do you believe this? No. Do you believe this? No. And do you consider someone that doesn't believe this to you know to be Christian? No. Well, <laughs> then you have a faith statement, right? <laughs> but they want to say no creed but the Bible, but that, that that's you know that's an impossible ability. Um. It'd be interesting to see where this is going to go, mm-hmm. you know. But I, you know, I mean, our commandments clearly state that beer is all right. I just, I don't get the, the you know, the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the absolute ban on alcohol, you know, or within six hours you can't have a drink, you know, alcohol six hours of a school event. I think that's a, that's more than a little silly. Uh, you're not supposed to tell the students who are over twenty one. Yeah, I had a beer last night. That's you know, that's getting a little bit uh, silly. Uh, although, I do remember a friend of mine, he went to uh, Fuller Seminary to get his uh, deem in. And um, he answered some question in class, and a uh, guy came up to him afterwards, and he said, uh, Are you Lutheran? And he goes, Yeah. He goes, Yeah, I thought so. This was the way he answered the question and, and stuff. He said, I th- I was back and going, this guy's got to be Lutheran. He says, I'm, I'm a Wisconsin Synod pastor. And he goes, oh, I'm a Missouri Synod pastor. He says, oh, okay. So they, he, so they're talking stuff. Guy goes, when you come back to my room? He goes, yeah. So they go up to the guy's room and stuff and they're sitting there talking and stuff. And the guy goes, you want to see something? He opens up the little mini fridge in the room and goes, I snuck beer on campus. <laughs> Because it's a dry campus, <laughs> you know. And uh, when I went to Gordon College, Gordon Conwell, it's the same thing. But I think you know, having a dry campus, you know, policy for the students is different than having it for the faculty, right? You know, especially yeah. say, you know, you can't go to uh, Chili's or you can't go to Patriot, you can't go to uh, a Patriots game and have a beer. That's a public place, right? It's, that's silly. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, dry campus, even then. You know, with your even with your students, um, you can control whether they bring it alcohol on campus or not. But if they're of legal drinking age, uh, you shouldn't be able to control whether they drink off campus. Right. You know. And, uh... So I had a friend that that went to a uh, some kind of Bible college, and um, and and they had uh they had a curfew, and like you had to be in the dorms by midnight. And so what happened is they'd they'd be out, you know, sitting at a Denny's somewhere, and you go, ah, twelve oh five, oh we missed curfew. Well, they didn't do a bed check or anything, so, oh, well, I guess we're staying out all night. <laughs> well, down in Concordia, Missouri, we we had a curfew. Well, we didn't. Really, yeah, we did have a curfew because the dorms were locked at a certain time at night, and if you didn't have a key, you can get in. My wife was an RA. She had a key, so it didn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, it, but that was that was an, an issue, you know. But part of that was just safety. They just didn't want to leave the dorms unlocked all night, mm-hmm. you know. And nor did they want to give a key to every student. Oh, see, uh, yeah, we just had when I, at University of Wisconsin, just every student had a key. So. But now, of course, you just have electronic passes just wave in front, and, you know, a little bit, a little bit nice, a little bit different. But that means the issue of security and stuff. So, but we'll see how things turn out with shorter 
Maybe they should just, you know, leave and then see about coming back. Come with me if you want to live. Or should we talk about health care? Um, yeah, let's on uh, the whole college issue. Yeah. As long as we're talking about colleges and Catholic colleges, um, let's, let's go ahead and talk about... Uh, we have two different schools. It's sort of the same story. Um, it started out in Ohio, uh, Steubenville, uh, Franciscan University, and then is being followed by Ave Maria University in uh, in Florida. Um, and catch the city, but um, basically we've talked about uh, the whole uh, health care um, issue about uh, the the new government health care laws requiring churches uh, and or church organizations that do their own uh, insurance to provide free uh, contraception and um, including uh, was it plan B which we don't consider contraception um, because the whole purpose is to prevent implantation which would make an, an, an abortive fashion right. and of course these are Catholic schools so they're saying no to uh, um, all um, uh, contraception anyway. Mm -hmm. So the first one was the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and it says it is discontinuing its health care plan completely. A, because uh, the Obama administration has mandated that all health insurance plans include contraception, sterilization, and abortion-causing medications as a part of the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare which uh, causes us to violate the consistent teachings on the sacredness of human life. But B, because um, the coverage that Obamacare is going to require is simply too expensive. Um, you know, you've got to have a more robust coverage. You've got to have a minimum uh, coverage now that they're saying it's got to be. And they're just like, we can't afford this. It's going to at least um, uh, double the cost of it from uh, $50 a month to $100 a month. But even after that, they're saying that's just next year. It's going to go to, to – it, it'll double in price. Who knows where it's going to go from there, but it's not going to go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and that's the student health care you know, where – you, you're expecting it to be, um, you know, a real affordable um, kind of sort of minimal package. So that they've got it in case of emergencies and, you know, sort of basic coverage and things like that without anything, um, you know, without any sort of special premium uh, kind of services. And, um, you know, the whole idea is we want to make sure all our students are covered. And and most colleges have some sort of a student plan like that. Now, with the um, Obamacare, does cover most students should be covered under their parents' insurance if their parents have insurance and and a family plan. And <clears throat> but for those who don't, uh, I didn't when I was in school. Uh, they well, <clears throat> while I was in college, I was covered, but that's. It was. It helped that my parents worked for the university. But um, once I got married, that was it. And um, and so then we had uh, seminary coverage. And uh, but we our vicarage year we had like we had it and then we didn't. And I mean we went a few months without any kind of coverage, which was pretty scary. Well, yes and no. I mean, you, you, you know, in a way, it's scary if something, you know, if you were in an accident or something like that. But the reality is, is that being fairly young, you know, you, you, your, your costs are pretty minimal. Yeah. Uh, um, pregnancy. First, 
Uh, well, yeah, that you know that could be. Well, that you know, there's just ways to take care of that, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, but I mean, my my uh, my first church, we left Concordia Plan because the majority of our faculty, all but two, were uh, under the age of forty. Well, you know, our entire church congregation, except the senior pastor and, and one of the teachers, were all under the age of forty, and we would go to Concordia Plan for less than half the cost. Because they were like the the, 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 the uh, uh, insurance company, was like you're not going to cost us anything, you know. We know, you know, they knew they'd make money on us because the chances of one of us getting very ill was very was very remote. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy who's fifty, it's another thing. Yeah, here it is. It's in the other one. Um, yeah, the other college, college, by the way, is struggling with this is uh, Ave uh, Ave Maria University down in Florida, which was started by. Um, the guy who started uh, Domino's Pizza, Tom Mohegan, he was the one who put the money up for this school. And both Franciscan and Steubenville and Ave Maria are very, very serious Catholic colleges. Unlike Georgetown or even Notre Dame, I mean, these t- are the, the, these places you go to and you are at a Catholic school. And this it takes it takes it, this, everything, this faith statement, very seriously. Um, but they said that the... the Normal insurance for the, the college covered insurance for the students is going to go up 65 to 80 percent in the coming year. Um, and even more so because next year, Obamacare will require coverage limits to be at least a hundred thousand dollars and higher after that. Well, here again, once again, here's the question that needs to be asked is, you know, how many students 18 to 22 are going to wind up in a situation where they're going to need coverage of a hundred thousand dollars or more in a given year. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. that's just there's just not that many. <clears throat> um, and you know, that, and that's you know, all students without saying, okay, so do any you know what kind of issues might these students have? Yes, if they have a a drug problem or a mental mental uh, ish, health issue or some other issues. There might be a need to have that kind of coverage, but just of, of every student, um, you know, you got to ask the question: How necessary is that? Right. Yeah, but it's you know it's it's a blanket thing uh, for the whole country, so um, so it's not covered. And I, you know, <clears throat> oh, but you know what they said: We have to pass the bill so you can find out what's in it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and that's the the final comment. These are are unintended consequences of what happens when you hastily pass a thousand page bill. <laughs> so, yeah. except the fact it wasn't a thousand page bill; it was a two hundred twenty seven hundred page bill. Which one guy was asked if he read it? He goes, "Heck no, I haven't read it." What do you think I am, a lawyer? It takes three lawyers and uh, something else to read through all this bill. I ain't got that kind of time. Thank you, Congressman. <laughs> well, um. And, yeah, these are some very negative uh, issues um, that that are are, are coming true. And, you know, um, the question is now that there's these two Catholic schools, um, how many others may wind up dropping out as well, you know, dropping their coverage? It's going to be an interesting situation. You know, students coming to Massachusetts all have to show evidence of health co- of health coverage. Get us killed, or worse, expelled. Yeah, because we require everybody here, all the students here, to have health health insurance as a state law. So it either has to be covered by the college, university, or through their parents. Go home. Go. So, I mean, you know, th- so this is a, a tough thing. I, um, you know, my... My attitude toward uh, the whole Obamacare thing is that the system is broken and I haven't come up with anything better. Um, you know, I, I'm not convinced that that this uh, is necessarily um, better. It, it sort of depends who you are um, than than what we already had. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not, you know, the, it's not directly affecting me, but uh, not yet, as far as I know. But it, you know, this is these are tough issues that uh, schools find themselves dealing with, and and obviously the the bigger issue uh, from our standpoint, uh, being a religious news show, is that this is putting schools in a very difficult position where the school is founded on a certain set of faith principles, 
and uh, and faith is more than what you do on Sunday mornings. It's the rest of your life. And um, so when when schools are are put in a position where they're forced to compromise their faith or or to choose between compromising their faith and um you know and and, and making uh, pretty significant sacrifices, uh, you know it, it makes it very difficult. So, right. but speaking, and oh, it's sorry. very important how you frame this issue. Right. Is this a contraception issue or is this a religious freedom issue? And from my perspective, it's a religious freedom issue. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, to a certain extent, I, you know, on certain issues of contraception there, you talk about, you know, uh, plan B and stuff like that. Okay. I understand where they're coming from. Catholic Church is coming from and I tend to agree with them. However, um, uh, having said that, um, I, I, you know, contraception overall, I have no problem with. Lutheran Church has never had a problem with it. But it's religious freedom. Right. They should have the right to say, "This is this is we're Catholic Church. This is what we believe. This is what we teach. Our insurance is going to be done. And if you don't like the fact that we don't, we're not going to." cover you for contraception you don't need to come here mm-hmm. you know I, uh, I when the one woman uh, testified before Congress at Georgetown I just then she was complaining about it I just honestly said why did you go to Georgetown right yeah, if you got exactly. accepted to Georgetown you could have gotten accepted to Harvard to Yale to a lot of to uh, uh, University of Michigan Law School to a lot of top flight law schools in the country because Georgetown's a top flight law school. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, and all of them going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So why'd you choose to go there? Right. You know, you're the one who said, you're the one who applied. Yeah, for that matter, you go to Harvard. I mean, I know somebody that's going to Harvard Law School, and um, and he's basically gotten a full ride scholarship. And and because of, they, they get so much money uh, from donors that, um, that they're able to pass that on with really, really nice scholarships to um, to their students. But that there's the reality. Once again, though, I mean, you know, why do I why apply to go to a college or university where I know some of the practices that they're going to have? I disagree with. Doesn't make sense. No, no, not when there's so many options. Right. Uh, okay, go ahead. You're. I interrupted you. Okay. So, um, moving on. Speaking of uh, having to compromise your principles. Um, because you're uh, between your faith and and having to do uh, make sacrifices, let's talk about Mitt Romney. We are the Yogurt President. Um, you know, the, all right. So here, here's the issue: Mitt Romney uh, is a Mormon. Everybody knows that. This is common knowledge, and and the news media has made way too much uh, hay out of it. And. Um, <clears throat> I believe he probably been a Mormon for at least twenty years. He's probably never listened to a thing that's gone on in the church. He has no idea what is going on there. That's what the President Obama said. I'm sure it works the same way. <laughs> well, you know, they mentioned how, um, you know, his involvement. He's he's pretty involved. Uh, oh yeah, he, in the Mormon he, church. He, yeah, well, he is he is a uh, temple Mormon. He is a very very good Mormon, a very prominent Mormon. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you know he he teaches Sunday school and and follows all of the you know the if when you look at at what it means to be a Mormon and, and what your life looks like they really sort of you know this is you've got your um, uh, family home meetings and your you know there's like there's all these things that you have to do you know and, and we as Lutherans we tend to talk about you know. Well, this is a this is a good idea to to practice this or or that or you know whatever. But you know, for them, it's requirements, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and, and even things like keeping a uh, year's worth of um, of uh, canned goods or other non perishable food items, and you know, and, and things like that. There, I mean, there's a lot of you know, and, and of course the all right, what do you call it, the the magic underwear? I'm, I'm trying to trying to be respectful um, of the people, uh, even though I always call it the magic underwear, you know. But it's a it's the, the, a white robe that they wear under their clothing. Right. So, you know, um, I mean, I, 
I can't remember. I, I feel bad, but um, I, I don't know what the term is for it. But Okay, here's the question. Okay, and, and this article talks about the fact that his faith does, in, you know, invoke and affect what he does. Personally, one of the questions I've always been, how intelligent people can believe that the Native Americans were actually the ten tribes of Israel? I, I've yet to figure out when the, the DNA evidence and everything else says against it. Okay, I really... I really wonder how these very intelligent PhDs and stuff. There's a, there's a professor at Harvard Business School who's a friend of Romney's from church from the Mormon Steakhouse up here. Yeah, I'm just like, and I work with Feed the Need, which is a, a organization to, to, that raises food and funds for food pantries. And the majority of the board of directors is Mormon. And I just sit there and I go, how can how can you? You're such intelligent people. How can you believe this stuff, which is manifestly archaeologically not true? Yeah, well, uh, you know that, and the fact that there's horses everywhere um, in the in the Book of Mormon, but there were no horses in the um, in the Americas until uh, the Spaniards brought them over, you know, like fourteen hundred years later. And uh, I mean, you know. there's just, but it's just all the stuff that manifestly is not true. I mean, that's just all there is to it. You mm-hmm. can't get around it. Um, but I asked a Mormon you know, about that once. Yeah. I said, and, and I said, you know, where's the archaeological evidence? Because, like, there's so much of, of the Bible that you can point to. You know, here are these cities. Here's these people groups. Here's, you know, you've got DNA evidence. You know, I've even seen, um, um, uh, what do you call it, mitochondrial uh, DNA evidence that supports um, the uh, Noah, the, the eight people on the ark. Um, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And, and, and so there's, there's, there's just all this evidence for, um, for the stuff in the Bible. Then you, you look at the archaeology for the Book of Mormon and there's nothing. And, and it, so I asked this guy, one of these missionaries that showed up at my door about it. And, um, and he says, well, sure, you know, we know about the, the, uh, Native American, um, people and, um, and, and, and I said, yeah, but they weren't called what the Book of Mormon says they're called. He says, well, you know, you got the Lamanites, right? You got the Mayans, Lamayan, Laman. I'm like, really? That's what you're hanging it on? <laughs> That's really desperate. <laughs> right. But you and, also have yeah. to remember that for Mormons, it's, you know, intellect really isn't it, it intellect is trumped by feeling, right? But anyway, uh, Mormon they said um, is uh, Romney they, they said is desert, you know, which is uh, industrious. It's a honeybee, and he uh, works very hard. Um, it's in, it's interesting. Um, uh, uh, that that. that uh, and, you know, it is possible to employ the Mormon gospel in a wider world. It's interesting. He talked about Stephen Covey's book, uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the guy says, his Latter-day Saint theology repackages his career advice. I make it clear that your job is at stake. Well, whatever. You know, you look at, at how many uh, different uh, Christian, you know, I mean, that's, you look at, um, oh, Who's the financial guy? I always forget his name. Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. All right. Um, and you look at the, oh, it was a number of years ago. It's not around anymore, but the way down, uh, workshop, you know, using the Bible to lose weight. And- oh. oh, then there's, uh, John Maxwell, who uh, is a, you know, Christian pastor, but big leadership business leadership guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy, Andy, uh, Stanley. Stanley. Uh, if you listen to his thing, I mean, a lot of his stuff in basic leadership. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's kind of church based. It, it's church based, but it's most, but it's also uh, very, um, you know, usable in business. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so I mean, and that's interesting that uh, you know one of his beliefs is uh, you know his 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 high patriotism and how that affects him. Um, dean of business school at Utah U- State University. Says, you know, he is an unabashed, unapologetic believer that America is the promised land. Uh, leading it is an obligation, responsibility to God. Don't think of it as work. The whole point is just to enjoy yourself. 
Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, Mormons believe that when Jesus comes back, um, whereas a lot of uh, Christians, uh, especially your um, uh, dispensationalist, premillennialist, um, like your left behind folks, uh, believe that Jesus is going to come back and establish an earthly reign in um, in Jerusalem. The Mormons believe that he's going to do it in Independence, Missouri. Mm-hmm. I've been I've been by the temple a lot many times. So, um, which by the way is owned by the temple a lot Mormons, not owned by the actual Mormons. Ah, oh, different ones. Um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, but anyway, um. So the big question, though, is uh, in his campaigning, um, you know, he, he tries to avoid all the sort of um, slander and negative campaigning and stuff like that. But, I mean, we all know that you cannot run a successful campaign without slinging mud. I mean, you can't. It's been tried and never successfully. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure that there's some exceptions out there with some local campaigns or something like that but but any national campaign it cannot be won because what it comes down to is people listen to dirt well okay um <clears throat> unlike most people you know we've got experience with Mitt Romney here in Massachusetts um first off when he ran against Ted Kennedy and he gave ten, Ted Kennedy the run for his life and um, he was not afraid to go after President Kennedy, uh, 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 Senator Kennedy. Um, I mean, I remember black and white, you know, the use of the black and white. And in fact, you know, he looked fat and overweight, which he was, uh, you know, detailing. I mean, drug, true stuff, you know, his drug, his drug abuse, I mean, his, his drinking problems, um, his womanizing. Uh, I remember them talking about um, the Anita Hill stuff and how he just kind of sat there stone silent because you know he really couldn't speak about you know sexual abuse uh, and, and you know issues in in, in the um, sexual harassment issues or harassment that would seem to be the big issue there. How did you pronounce that word? Um, you know issues in, in in Washington. You know he was one of the worst perpetrators himself. Um, so, I mean, he's not above, you know, putting out what's factual information. Matter of fact, there's been a number of articles who, who's pointed out that, you know, he, when uh, President uh, Obama's team has gone after him on, on negative issues, that he has not, um, you know, hesitated to, to turn right around and say, you know, you know, the pot's calling the kettle black here. You know, so you put all these people out of business, main capital, put all these people out of business, uh, uh, workers out of work. You know, A, I wasn't there. B, you're, you know, uh, um, your um, um, auto restructuring committee put a whole bunch of people out of work when they closed all these dealerships. You know, so you, you've made the same decision. You know, only you're using government money. I'm using private money. <laughs> So he's he's not afraid to go after uh in and in, in stuff. Um the other thing is there's not a whole lot that he needs to go if you talk about slinging mud, there's plenty of other groups out there who'll sling the mud for him. Mm -hmm. Well, right yeah. And he can sit back and say, "I'm sorry, I didn't I have no control over these people." Yeah, it doesn't say I approve this message. No, it doesn't say I approve it. Um, you know, so there's American Crossroads by Carl Rove, there's all kinds of other organizations, and it all brings in those two beautiful words, plausible deniability. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, he's not speaking out against them either. <laughs> so, You know, he, um, well, I mean, he can say, what good would it do? Um, I don't see President Obama telling his supporters to pull, to pull their ads. Right. So, you know. Uh, and you know, and, and 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 as a basic principle, my belief is the answer to negative speech is more speech. <laughs> so I mean, so but the, you know, this is any for any Christian that wants to um, operate in the public sphere. Uh, you know, this is this is something you have to deal with. 
Uh, it's it's a reason that okay. It's it's only one of many reasons I'd never run for public office, um, but it, it's definitely one of the reasons. I you know I just to to have to go around and okay, well yeah, it might be true, but uh, you know even if it's true, is it is does it how much does it actually weigh on the campaign? You know, um, what does it have to do you with this never person? Have it. Plausible deniability. You'd never have to do anything. Other people would do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But, I mean, yeah, they, they, there is the issue. I mean, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, you, if you do it, you got to look at it as a secular vocation and, you you, you know, and, and doing the best you can. Um, but it is kind of a, a, a negative thing. And, you know, once again, somebody asked me, you know, what I thought about him being Mormon, could I vote for him? It goes back to, well, I don't think he's the, you know, I think he's got a screwed up theology. What's that have to do with him being president? I don't know. Hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I've heard a lot of stuff, but people say, well, the Mormons are trying to take over the government and all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, not the way that people think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they want to be. They want to influence the government. Well, don't we all? <laughs> you know. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, don't don't take your theology from. But then again, I wouldn't take my theology from. Boy, probably any of the presidents that we've had, at least not in in my lifetime. Um, you know, they've all said things that made you kind of go, huh? You know, even George W. Bush, who wore his faith on his sleeve so much, you know, there were stories that we talked about um, back in the day where he would say things and, and kind of made you go, what are you talking about? Which, by the way, before I forget, this is our anniversary episode. Yesterday was our... Si wait. Yes, yeah, sixth anniversary of CrossFeed. Wow. Yeah. We just don't know when to quit. <laughs> Sad as a thing that, that is. We should know when to should know when to quit. Should should have not quit a long time ago. <laughs> Probably. Um well speaking of quitting, I was a really great uh article at um CNN uh belief log of all places about quitting church and coming back. And um, uh, this is by uh, Andrea Palpin Dilly. And um, just a really great article. Uh, it talks about how she was sort of raised in the church and it kind of didn't mean a whole lot to her. And, um, and she drifted away. She had, uh, she really struggled with the, um, we call the problem of evil. Why is there evil in the world? Why is there so much suffering? And um, and she couldn't get answers uh, from church, and so she drifted away. And um, you know, in a nutshell, she tried different things and kind of got out of it for a while, and finally came back. Not because she had hit rock bottom or or anything like that, but she realized that she couldn't find the answers outside of church either. And, uh, so, well, if you're going to look for answers, you might as well go look for answers where you might actually find some answers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I really liked how she, um, uh, kind of summed it up. She says, my doubt belonged in church. Um, people who know my story ask what I would have changed about my spiritual journey. Nothing. I had to leave the church to find the church, and when I came back, the return wasn't clean or conclusive. Since then, I've come to believe that my doubts belong inside the space of the sanctuary. My questions belong on the altar as my only offering to God. Right. And, and I thought that was just so profound and, and so important for people to hear and, and to understand that doubts are okay and they're normal. And we all experience them. Mm -hmm. Even your pastor experiences doubts. Right? And, um, and you know, it's just part of living in a fallen world. And, um, but it's, it's knowing what to do with those doubts. 
and and how to explore them and um and and how to to struggle with them and and to uh you know where to turn and 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 all those sorts of things and um and and so i just this this just really touched my heart and it's also i've been reading a book uh called you lost me and it's specifically about the sort of 20 something generation um and um uh, and and it talks about one of the you know sort of the issues uh about how we've sort of lost that generation and 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 yeah people at that age tend to drift away from church and then come back later but the problem's a lot worse now than it used to be and um and and it talks about on the one hand some of its generational issues because there's a much greater sense of entitlement and a, a much greater uh, emphasis on things like fashion and entertainment and, you know, other sort of shallow pursuits than previous generations. Um, but at the same time, there's part of the blame, and from my experience, a lot of the blame, uh, lays with the church, and that what we've offered them has been very shallow. And, and you know, I'll take a, a, an example that's probably common to most of our listeners and viewers. And that is, you look at your youth group, and and what do you what do you offer for your youth? And um and from what I've seen is you you've got some Bible study of some kind or, or devotions and that, but the major part of being in the youth group is having fun, going to amusement parks and going bowling and going you know whatever it is, it's going out and having fun. And the idea being, well, they're they're doing stuff connected with the church. Well, that's great, but are they actually growing? Are they are they actually seeing how their faith connects with um, with their lives? And and overall, we've done a pretty lousy job of of connecting people that way. That that just because a, a person is involved in stuff at church doesn't mean they're necessarily growing in faith. So God answers the uh, question of the problem of evil in Job. And uh, he says, uh, yeah, you know what? You wouldn't get it. Uh, I created the world, and uh, my un- ability to understand these things is a little bit bigger than the little cantaloupe inside your head that sums up everything that you know and can possibly comprehend. And um, and he just leaves it at that. We go, wait, what? <laughs> um right. But he's God, and and you know part of of what God wants us to understand is that, um, you know we we're gonna have doubts and we're gonna have struggles and and um so just trust in Him instead of you know trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Yep. Um, at the end of the at the end of the line, and the guys, it's real. I told my kids confirmation. Guys, sometimes real simple. God's basic answer is, "I'm God, you're not." Right. You know, figure figure it out. You know, right. it's just. But I like this one because she talks about this, that, you know, doubt's a part of the faith. You know, I believe help my unbelief. Right. You know, uh, uh, um, and then she says one thing, she gets there in church and she gets no other place else um, is the space to search for God and to answer those questions and, if, and explore them. And, and I agree. I agree. We need to be people that tell people, kids, tell people it's okay to have those questions. I mean. That's what uh, one part of what I was talking about this morning. Uh, to the whole thing of you know finding out Santa Claus isn't real and everything, you know. And now she's beginning to wonder: Well, is the Bible real? Is Jesus real? And then as we really you know talked about that stuff. Those those questions she had got answered. And uh, one of the other kids uh, in class one time this year came in and said, "How do we know Jesus is real? How do we know he really existed?" And so we spent a whole hour, the whole class one time, looking at the historical evidence for Jesus outside mm-hmm. the Bible. And so it was just a really neat opportunity for us to, you know, and I talked about how we exploit those. I said, it's not going to be the only doubt you're going to have. I've had other kids come up to me with all these questions one, two years after confirmation. It's fine, you know, five years after. It's fine to have those. The issue is not that you're going to have doubts, but know where to take the doubts to. Right, yeah. And no way to find the answers. answers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it, it always amuses me when the kids in my confirmation class ask questions like that, 
And, um, you know, and, and the, they're legitimate questions that they're struggling with. And, but at the same time, they're, they go, Oh, we derailed him. You know, we got him off the topic and we got him off on this tangent, except the questions that I really want to discuss and answer are the things that are heavy on their hearts. The, the, the questions that they're actually asking, what's the point of ask of answering questions that nobody's asking? Right. Um, so sometimes it's, you know, I, and, and I, you know, there's an article, I don't know if you saw it in the Lutheran witness or it was online, but anyways, by this Missouri district, uh, um, uh, uh, president, and he asked. He said, "You know, you've been baptized and catechized in Lutheran faith. Why? Why'd you leave it to go somewhere else? Go to some other church? I don't understand that." And I'm sitting there going, "Have you been out of the parish that long? I can answer that question real quickly because you answered questions the kids weren't asking, right? And they just went through the motions, and it's not really being followed up in the house." I can tell you exactly why, you know, and um, because I know when I was in eighth grade, eighth grade, I had all these questions answered. In ninth grade, I had all the questions. Now I wanted the answers. How do I find them? Right. You know, and 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 that's you know that's that's the struggle. And to, to encourage, you know, so you know, and, you know, I told the kids this: don't. I'm still here. The church is still here. We still love you guys. You know, God, God. God welcomes your doubts and your questions. Don't be afraid of that. Yeah. Uh, My vicarage supervisor used to say, God has big shoulders. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and so he can handle anything you can throw at him. Right. That's what I, you know, so. Anyway, but I thought that was a wonderful article she wrote and a wonderful article of reflection. I just uh, thought that was really cool. Again, maybe you got some, read through the stories. Maybe you guys have different comments, different thoughts. Um, it has been nice. Like, you know, even though we have been off now for a couple of months, we've gotten notes from uh, our good friend, uh, um, is it Alexis or? Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, Over on YouTube, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, or is it Zandra? She goes with Zandra. Zandra. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Zandra. Uh, and on YouTube, and we've gotten uh, emails from Dave down in Virginia and from our good friend George. Uh, video links, uh, possible stories to follow up on, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and we thank you for all that. We really do, you know, pay attention to all those things. Um, we've got something, Dale's got something going on next week, but the week after that, we should be back, and then we should be back pretty solid for a while. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we're getting into the summer. Things are, I wouldn't say things are slowing down, but the schedule's not as packed anymore. Right. And then we've got uh, one... Um, not, I don't really have anything till July when I gotta go do camp, and then I have two weeks off in, from taking my vacation in Virginia. So, uh, in Germany, when I say Virginia, two weeks off in, in Germany. So, um. Yeah, and I have no idea right yeah. now. There's a number of things that I'm dealing with that are causing my summer schedule to be up in the air right now. So, um. So, uh, but we should be back more than we, than, than, than not. Uh, yeah. it's been extremely busy that this, to this spring. And we do apologize for that because last week we were both very excited about coming back and <laughs> time yeah. more better ideas. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was so frustrating. Anyway, we hope uh, God watch over, bless you. Please feel for free to send us comments, notes. It's always good to hear from everybody. Um, and the Lord watch over and bless you. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.